And I just want to say uh, a few words about uh, being an energy minister, having come into the job uh, more than, a little more than three months ago now. It's been very clear to me what the main uh, pressures, what the main achievements and what the main challenges are uh, in terms of government. Uh, I came in uh, to the office in, uh, on July the 24th, uh, 2019, and I was the last appointment made uh, that day for people attending the cabinet. And I was asked, I think at 11 p.m., um, to hold on because the Prime Minister would uh, be speaking to me. That's not him, I don't think. <laughs> but uh, but uh, he, he, he was told, uh, he, I was told, the Prime Minister with, will be with you shortly. And uh, sh little did I know, but shortly actually meant half an hour. So I was on the phone uh, for half an hour with this deep, beep, beep bo uh, uh, voice. Uh, and anyway, he, he came onto the, the line and he said, energy. And I said, yes, Prime Minister, that is a fantastic thing we should be driving forward. Uh, we need a lot more energy in the government. And he said, no, no, I want you to be Minister for Energy. <laughs> so I very gladly took the role. And, and actually, um, my, as a constituency MP, I had been uh, having dealings with BP uh, for nine years now. BP have a huge research uh, centre in my constituency. I'd had a finance background, so uh, energy was something that I've been thinking about uh, for years. And uh, it seems to me that uh, there were two uh, big successes we've had. The first success, I think, which is the success of the 2010s, the success of the decade, has been the offshore wind uh, industry. We've had remarkable success with that. The uh, auction round three, uh, we saw a price at £39 per megawatt hour, which is remarkable because only four short years ago, we had a price of £119 uh, per megawatt hour. So that was a two-thirds reduction in the price uh, over four years. And people who I speak to in the industry, in the offshore wind industry, have said to me that when they started, you know, 15, maybe even sometimes 20 years ago, uh, this seemed like a pipe dream. So this is a, an area where we've had considerable success. More broadly, when people look at the challenges, I always say, you know, we've, we've, we've actually come a long way in this country in terms of zero carbon or reducing uh, carbon emissions. Since 1990, we have re reduced our carbon emissions by more than 40%, while we've actually grown our, uh, our economy uh, by two-thirds, by more than 65%. So it's, it's an impressive record. We've, we've already come a long way, but obviously there's much more to do. You'll be very pleased to know that my office is um, only about 150 yards away, and I did my bit. I actually walked with my private secretary over here even though my driver was insisting that he would drive me. But luckily, and this is again another innovation, um, I have a, an electric vehicle. Uh, I insisted um, that we should have an electric vehicle, and we've got a hybrid as well, I think, in the department. So we're doing well on that front. And lastly, what I would say is that I, I think the, uh, you've spoken about government drivers. I think it's very easy for uh, us as a depart department, as a government, to launch consultations, uh, to have uh, initiatives and to say and promise a lot of things. I have been very clear with the Prime Minister and also with the Department that we, start have, we have to start making choices, we have to start making decisions. There's a huge uh, a range of issues and I'll throw them up and maybe we, they'll be subject for future discussion uh, in no particular order. I think CCUS is very important. We've already invested 50 million in that, but we need to upscale uh, the investment uh, in the development of CCUS. I think we have to make some decisions about uh, nuclear and the future of the nuclear industry, how that will help us reach uh, the net zero carbon target uh, in terms of power generation uh, by 2050. I think we have to look at other nuclear technologies like SMRs and AMRs. Um, we've taken, I think, a tough decision, but a, a timely and good, a correct decision on fracking. Uh, we've, you know, after 10 years, we've said that uh, we've, uh, we're going to have a moratorium because, frankly, a Richter scale event of 2.9 uh, is not acceptable, and many people uh, in Preston, uh, New Road, around Lancashire, have expressed concerns about that, and we've listened to that. And then I think more broadly, we, uh, this is my broad, uh, my final uh, point that I'll leave to you. Um, I, David Cameron always used to say that there was no uh, quicker way of make, turning a liberal into a conservative than making them a junior minister in the Home Office. <laughs> and I, I, I have my own sort of version of that. I'm someone who has always championed the free market, has always championed uh, free enterprise, 
Um, but I think that in order to reach our targets, we have to uh, have a cooperation between government and the private sector. I don't think the private sector on its own will deliver the net zero carbon target, nor do I think the government on its own uh, will, will do so either. It has to be a conjunction, a, a cooperation between the government and the private sector. And so I would say that you know, one way of turning a kind of Hayekian free market liberal into a government interventionist is by making him or her an, a, an energy minister. So that's my, um, my conclusion. But I think there are huge challenges. I think that uh, one thing we have to do is be very flexible about our, our approach in terms of technologies uh, generating power. Um, and there are other challenges. I mean, the, the bigger challenge for me is uh, domestic challenges, getting uh, individuals in their homes to think about energy efficiency, uh, use things like heat pumps, adopt electric vehicles. There's a huge battle, if you like, uh, to be fought uh, to win hearts and minds so that people actually buy into the net zero carbon mission. So uh, those are uh, my kind of broad thoughts, and I'm sure you'll have questions uh, examining uh, any individual thing I've said in the last uh, 10 minutes. So thank you very much. Why don't we have a seat? Let's have a seat. We seem to have energy ministers as often as we have elections. Um, so we had <laughs> your predecessor here last year, asked, are you going to be in the job? Yes, absolutely. Big change. Um, no one knows what's going to happen. But in terms of how you see your government, uh, should you come back in power, your sort of feel for energy. How important is it to Boris Johnson? How important is it? I think it's crucially important to the government. I mean, we had a, and I could have talked uh, for five minutes about this, we, we had a uh, zero carbon uh, target, which yep. is enshrined in law, the zero carbon, net, uh, carbon, net zero carbon emissions yep. by 2050. And we're the first country in the OECD, the first developed uh, country economically to have such a target. So that's a strategic goal. Uh, the Prime Minister also announced uh, a subcommittee looking at climate change, uh, looking at these issues, specifically at these issues. So it's absolutely the centre of the government. Did you miss a trick with what Labour announced over the weekend? They've got their green industrial revolution. They're committing to do things for our housing stock. You've been in power f since 2010 in coalition and directly since 2015. They stole a ride on you, didn't they? So I think the housing stock issue is absolutely critical, and I alluded, that, uh, alluded to that briefly at the end of my remarks. The one thing that I've heard about their plans, mm -hmm. which has got the industry up in arms, is the offshore wind idea, where they said they were going to have state-run wind farms and they were going to own 51% of the, of the equity in these wind farms. Now, I'm speaking to you know, people who, Scottish Power, others who are involved in this sector, and they were amazed um, at this. And, they, and I, I've got a background in banking. I thought, why would anyone wa want to earn a 49% stake where John McDonnell owns 51%. Mm. I mean, is that an attractive investment proposition? Um, and I think that's, I mean, seriously, I think that isn't how to, to, to drive this uh, technology. Yeah, but that's a specific point. The wider point that they seem to be going on, where they seem to have stolen a uh, march on the Tories, is they're saying, grab the climate emergency. He was the first one to use it. We had a film earlier. Let's go for this green industrial revolution. Let's go and look at housing stocks so that everyone understands, change our boilers. These are things that actually the Tories could have done over the last 10 years. Yeah, but we have been it? doing them. I mean, one of the things I said in the remarks was that uh, over the last nine years, I mean, offshore wind has been a huge success. Yeah. And that success wasn't because we had state-owned wind farms. That success was because we set up a, a structure with the auctions, a financial incentive, if you like, structure. And um, you know, the private sector responded to that. And I think that's the best way to drive innovation and to get to the results we want. I don't believe that the state owning all these assets mm -hmm. is going to get you to the target you want, you want to get to. You're a historian, right? Thank You've you written know. some books available on Amazon, I hear. Very other good, good thank Other good bookshops. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this isn't just about my No, no, of course yeah. not, absolutely not. It's, no, it's not book talk. <laughs> um, what will historians write about this period when it comes to energy? Uh, if you look at the last sort of 10 years, mm. um, EMR, investment in Hinkley, which hasn't quite come to out, the change to electric vehicles. Are we in a pivotal point in terms of energy transition? I'll say two things about that. I mean, the first thing I'll say, I mean, we could do all the political yeah. point scoring and all that, but actually there's a de quite a wide degree of consensus in this issue. You compare climate change and energy issues to Brexit. You know, if you, the, 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 the bill <laughs> yeah. that went through 
uh, in June or whenever it was, June I think, uh, went through practically on the nod. There was very little dissenting, yeah. very few dissenting voices. And right across the spectrum of the House, there was, a, there was an agreement that we need to deal with this. You look at Brexit, it's mm. a completely different yeah. uh, issue. So there's a, I think that's one thing that historians would say is that there's a lot of consensus. The other big thing that's happened, uh, from a his, you know, if you're a historian looking at, looking at 300 years, really, mm. um, is the almost eradication of coal from the grid. Uh, coal, uh, for economic historians, people who know about British history, who care about you know, industry and the, the story of, of this country, coal was at the center of that. Uh, coal powered the Industrial Revolution. Coal was uh, basically, in a way, gave birth to the, to the Labour Party. I mean, the unions mm. were the strongest unions were the coal mining unions. So to come to a Britain where coal is not a big uh, driving factor in terms of energy is a huge, huge deal. And I think in 30 years' time or whenever, people looking back on this period will say that was a remarkable uh, thing to happen, a, a great achievement. The industry here, and they're sitting here, about two, three billion pounds worth of UK energy spending and energy here. They've been crying out for certainty. Yeah. And that's the last thing we've got. Sure. Do you think there is some certainty to be had for the people out there in the fact that whoever comes into power, I'm sure you hope it's the Tories, but Labour maybe, who knows where we'll be. Mm. But if we are on a pathway that you say there is more agreement, is there some certainty that they can make investment decisions saying, actually, this country is committed to the decarbonisation path? I think we're absolutely committed to this. I mean, um, the, and the way I uh, appreciate this is speaking to international counterparts. I mean, right. it was very interesting. As soon as I got the job, I must have had about 15 letters from various counterparts all around the world. You know, the South African Minister of Energy, the Brazilian Minister of Energy, the, I think China. Mm -hmm. all, everyone was interested in the appointment. And everyone, uh, a lot of people around the world looked to Britain as a kind of leader, thought leader in this, in this space. So I definitely think that, um, you know, we're, our commitment as a political uh, nation, irrespective, regard, of, irrespective yeah. of who's in power, yeah. to the decarbonizing uh, agenda is really strong. Is it, so, is it so world leading, would you say? I would say it's absolutely world leading. I mean, my co uh, contemporary friend, uh, colleague, uh, Zach Goldsmith, mm -hmm. uh, went over to New York uh, with his DEFRA uh, hat, and people were, were really interested in what he had to say about decarbonization, about climate change, about dealing with this, this issue. And I think uh, people are looking to Britain. We have, we've got COP26 yep. uh, next year in, in Glasgow. Your predecessor. Uh, Claire Perry will be chairing that. Yep. And again, uh, that's, a, that's a, a good example of international leadership. Uh, two, two quick points before I get to questions. Um, literally about three weeks ago, there was the Energy UK conference here. I don't know if some people were here for that. And Dermot Nolan, outgoing um, boss of Ofgem, uh, said two things. One, there needs to be more kicking of butt, frankly. <laughs> there needs to be uh, decarbonisation needs to have a regulatory framework. And he believed that Ofgem should be stronger than that and government should be there. And second, he said, it's been a good change, but there's not enough diversity. Now, it can sound like a tokenistic question, but I think you and I sitting here, probably 4% of oh, yeah, the right. diversity of the entire uh, yeah, I mean, energy sector. So let's pick up those two points. Is it up to government and Ofgem to regulate this decarbonisation? And two, what about the diversity issue? So I'll deal with the diversity first. I think yeah. absolutely diversity is something we've got to push. Yeah. Um, and I think we've done that uh, with the Bayes appointments. Obviously, I'm of uh, Ghanaian, West African heritage. We've got Nadim Zahawi, uh, who's a junior minister in the department, who's of Kurdish uh, background. And I'm, I'm not sure there have there been any um, uh, ministers in the recent times mm. from ethnic minorities in that department. So that was some, and that was something that um, yeah. actually the officials themselves, the civil servants themselves, yeah. were, were raised in a very positive way. Um, also, Claire uh, Perry was uh, energy minister for two years, yeah. which is quite a long time actually, in, given the, these days. the May government and yeah. the people coming and going. And again, that was uh, a really good uh, symbol about diversity. Of course, we could do better. I mean, I think we can always uh, improve diversity, but this was an industry, I mean, I was a banker 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and in those days, I mean, it was uniformly male, uniformly white, yeah. and, you know, people had been in the industry 20 years. Yeah. So I think we've made a lot of strides, uh, but we could always do better. On the first issue, I think we are gonna have to um, look at regulation. 
But we've got to make sure that the regulation is sensible regulation. Because one thing I don't want to do is simply just to burden business for the hell of it. Right. I think that we've got to be very careful about uh, 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 striking a balance between encouraging uh, you know, decarbonizing behavior while making sure that our businesses remain profitable. And that was one of the things that I'm very keen on uh, as, a, as a new minister, new-ish minister, was to make sure that the, to, for me, too often sitting on the outside on the back benches in other departments, too often there was a false battle, I think, drawn up between being green on one hand yeah. and being uh, economically ambitious, wanting to drive economic growth on the other. I, I don't see them. It was mutually exclusive. Yeah, right? it was like some mutually yeah. exclusive, you know, in the red corner, in the blue mm. corner, whatever. I'm not saying which one. Was the <laughs> but there was, there was this antagonism mm -hmm. that, was, that was presented. And I don't think that's the right way to look at it. I think the phrase clean growth is an excellent one because it, it shows that you can actually have your cake and eat it in this space. You can actually grow the economy while being um, green and uh, so environmental. If you secured a majority in the, in the forthcoming yeah. election and you're, I don't know which job you'll be, but say you're back in this job, mm. how much pressure are you going to put on Jonathan Brilley, the new boss of Ofgem, I think to say, create this framework where you regulate these people to take us to do carbonisation? Is that their job? Is I think Ofgem is part of the issue, but I think government is also part of the right. issue. I mean, what I want to do in government is to do things. Right. You know, we're, we're, the temptation in government is to have consultations and discussions and that, that's very important but actually it, the thing we have to do in this space in Bayes if I'm lucky enough to be in Bayes or whoever my successor is they're going to have to make decisions and they're going to have to drive actual things that happen so we need you know I mentioned CCUS that needs yep. a commercial structure financial incentives I think the offshore wind example has been a very good example of how government set a financial uh, incentives and the industry responded to that I think we're going to have to look at that kind of auction structure in other technologies. Uh, perhaps I think there's a debate as, about SMRs, there's a debate mm -hmm. about where if, well, we will probably have some more nuclear power, but where that is. Yeah. Um, you know, there are big decisions out there that we need to make. And that's the job of the minister, the job of the politicians is to try and make those decisions. Before I ask this question, how much pressure have you had from Extinction Rebellion? What, you've, what, you've, what have you thought about them? I haven't seen them. Actually, I'm going to tempt fate now because yeah, well, there's one here gonna, anyway. Gonna, um, but they haven't. They haven't. Uh, I haven't. I've seen what they've been doing yeah. around Westminster, but I haven't directly had. Yeah, but I mean, the general uh, point that they feel that they're giving grist to this, you know, feeling out there that the public wants action. Sure. I look, I think they, what they're doing. I mean, I don't like it when the kids are missing school yeah. and that sort of thing. I don't. I don't necessarily agree with that. But I think it's very important that people have passion and express themselves very clearly because they've clearly shifted, not necessarily Extinction Rebellion, but people who care passionately about this issue mm -hmm. have shifted the terms of debate. I mean, I speak to big oil companies. Yeah. They don't even call themselves oil companies anymore. No, of course they've changed, that, yeah. Um, in the last sort of five years, you, ne you never hear the phrase oil company. Um, and and I, I think that's a good thing. I mean, they're shifting their focus and saying, look, we, in order to attract talent, in order to do well in order to be good citizens mm -hmm. we have to absorb this uh this Public, issue yeah and i don't think they would necessarily have done that without people like extinction rebellion and others mm -hmm. you know really championing the cause now where i part company with mm -hmm. uh, uh extinction rebellion is i think we've actually had some achievements i think it's very easy to kick any government and say they've done nothing it's yeah. a disaster it's a, a complete waste of time all of that but I think that's wrong. I think we have actually had achievements. As I said, we reduced uh, carbon emissions by 40% more than that in the last 25 years, yet we've managed to grow our economy. That's, a, that's an achievement. Um, and we should be conscious of that while push, putting pressure on ourselves to, to do more. Should they be proud of their job? Who? Extinction Rebellion? No, they're, no. Oh, look, the sector, they're now the audience here. What am I going to say? The, yeah, no, the energy sector. Yeah, no, I think because last year, Claire Perry came and gave a, quite a rabble-rousing speech saying, you know, don't knock yourself, be, be proud. But with the, the, a year on, they're still in, gripped in uncertainty. Well, look, there's a, there's, a, there's a whole political uncertainty. Right. I mean, the one thing that... Uh, you, I mean, you know you'll be in your job in a month's time. Well, I'm, I hope so. I, I, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> Depends how this conference exactly, goes, exactly, really. Exactly. The sponsors don't absolutely, like it. We're, absolutely, I'm gone. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> So, you know, I've got to, I've got to yeah. fight a general election. I've got to get returned yeah. as an MP. And depending on the results of that election, um, I, you know, we could have a Labour government yeah. in six weeks' time or five weeks' time. So, um, you know, that political uncertainty is there, is overhanging us. 
And there's not much we can do about that. I think in terms of policy, in terms of the sector, I think there's much more clarity. You know, all the major parties are committed to decarbonization. Yeah. All the major parties understand uh, that we need some investment. There's, you know, this isn't just going to come from a clear blue sky. I, I question some of the parties' commitment to support business yeah. and uh, you know, the, f the financial uh, uh, expertise and, and wealth creation in the private sector, which <coughs> we need to draw on to meet our targets. Okay. Um, but that's, that's, in a way, I mean, it's a significant difference, but it's the main strategic objective is the same.